Um, well, today we are in the uh, chapter four of the Mormon scrapbook, which is the dealings with feelings section. Now, out of all of the lessons that are in the scrapbook, I think this one is the most important because um, essentially if you can get them convinced that they cannot rely on their feelings and then they have to rely on the Bible to know what the truth is, then Mormonism crumbles by itself. Okay, um, I don't have to, if I, do, if I do this one lesson and I do it right and they're convinced, then everything else is going to fix itself. Okay, uh, and so uh, out of all of them, I think this uh, has the, the most important um, understanding. Uh, and so to help you in communicating with Mormons, um, you need to know why they believe in what they believe. And uh, I want to tell you a little bit about how I was raised as a Mormon. Um, the reason why I believed in Mormonism was not because of facts or evidence. Um, the reason why I believed in Mormonism had to do with spiritual manifestations or feelings that I got. I believed God had told me that Joseph Smith was a prophet, and that was the basis for all of my truth. All of my decisions that I made was based on those spiritual manifestations. Um, I did not test them. I didn't go to the scriptures to find out if the spiritual manifestations I had came from God. I simply uh, left it to one little simple feeling. If I felt good, it came from God. If I felt bad, it came from the devil. And that goes to the first scripture that we're going to read, which is on this handout that I made to go along with the scrapbook. It's called the uh, Can We Rely on Feelings? Um, and so can I have uh, someone read Doctrine and Covenants uh, 9, verses 8 and 9? But behold, I say, un say unto you that you must study it out in your mind. Then you must ask me, if it be right, and if it is right, I will cause that your bosom shall burn within you. Therefore, you shall feel that it is right. But if it is not right, you shall have no such feelings. All right, so it's, it's really that simple. If I feel something good, then it comes from God. If I don't have that feeling, then it didn't come from God. I mean, and that's as simple as the test got for me as a Mormon. Um, and so I, I want to draw your attention to on uh, page 30, there's a, a little figure, figure 4-1, uh, and you'll notice that in the middle there's a big uh, circular thing with a slash through it, um, and factual data and physical proof has got a big slash through it because it means that they aren't relying on that for the reasons for why they believe. In fact, we're taught that physical information or physical data, uh, things that you can learn in this life, can lead you astray, and so you can't listen to that stuff. Um, and so, uh, if you, the way a Mormon thinks when it comes to, and you have to understand this too, Mormons are very smart people, okay? Um, they're not dumb people, but they compartmentalize, okay? When anything spiritual, anything that has to do with God and nature of God, they use their feelings to determine that, spiritual manifestations. When it comes to doing things in the world and, and you know, working in this life, then they use their heads and they think things through and they can be very smart, very intelligent. But what they've decided is that how you know anything's from God or the only way that you know something's from God is because you pray about it and God tells you. Uh, and so that's, that's how they work. And so um, for these positive spiritual feelings, if you start at the uh, top of the circle, okay, um, are viewed as a spiritual witness, okay, from the Holy Ghost, okay, which is a whole, the Holy Ghost confirming a spiritual truth, which leads to more feelings, which are then viewed as spiritual witnesses or the Holy Ghost confirming more spiritual truth. And so it's just something that continually goes on and on. And you can talk with a Mormon and you can absolutely be right. But if it goes against what their feelings are and they, they logically can see how you have a point, but they have their feeling or they have some type of a, a spiritual manifestation that tells them different. Well, they're going to go with that spiritual manifestation because that's what God told them, okay? And God knows better what's right. Uh, and so 
we, in order to be able to reach Mormons effectively, we have to be able to get around that. We have to be able to reach them right where they're at. And so on this uh, handout, I've given a, a three different ways um, that you can talk about this. Now, my own personal experience I can use uh, for witnessing to Mormons because I had spiritual experiences as a Mormon that lied to me. Uh, and so I can tell them about that. But you don't have that because you've never been Mormon. Uh, and so um, there are three things that I like to use. First is the Toronto incident. Um, and this goes to just knowing a little bit about church history, and you and they don't even have you don't have to read it to them, and they don't have to read it. You can just tell the story, um, because right after Joseph Smith finished translating the Book of Mormon, he needed to have money to be able to print the Book of Mormon. He didn't know how he was going to get it, and so he prayed and he asked God, "How can I get the money that I need?" to be able to uh, print the Book of Mormon. And so he gets a revelation telling him that if he sends Hiram Page and Oliver Cowdery into Canada, into Toronto, Canada, and to that they will be able to sell the copyright to the Book of Mormon in Canada, and then be able to raise all the funds they need to print the, co print the Book of Mormon in America, uh, in the United States. And so he sends them up there to do that, and they utterly fail. They can't find anyone that's going to buy the copyright. Um, and so when it comes, becomes apparent that they're not going to find anyone, they come back. And, um, they, but they have this really nagging problem for Joseph. They Joseph, how could you get a revelation from God telling us that if we go to Canada, we'll be able to sell the copyright? And it didn't come to pass because God knows everything that's going to happen. And Joseph's really perplexed. He doesn't know. He goes, I don't know how that could happen. So he prays again and he asks God, well, how did this happen? And he, uh, he gets this revelation that says some revelations are from God, some revelations are from man, and some revelations are from the devil. So all of them go, ah, well, Joseph, that's what happened. Okay, we don't believe that you were deceived by the devil, but you were so concerned about this, you know, printing the Book of Mormon that you received a revelation from yourself. Okay, and it wasn't from God. And so that's, that's how they, uh, they dismissed it and how they got through that. Now, it's very tempting, okay, at this point to say, well, that's a, a, a false prophecy. You can prove it right here. It shows that he's not a true prophet. And I would challenge you not to use that in that manner, okay? Um, the, the way that I would use... Um, this particular uh, Toronto incident is not to use it as a false prophecy, but to, to say um, if Joseph could not tell by his feelings what came from God or what came from the devil or what came from himself, then how can I use my feelings to determine what comes from God or what comes from the devil or what comes from myself? Because if my feelings can lie to me, and I could be led astray. I don't want that to happen. And it happened to Joseph. So how can I be sure? Okay. Uh, and so that's a way that we can start talking about whether those feelings are always reliable. Now, there's another question that I like to ask that I use in conjunction with this. Now, uh, most Mormons are unaware of this, but there's 165 different sects of Mormonism. Okay. Each one of them has their own true prophet. And they all claim to be the only true church on the face of the earth, okay? And all, so all the other Mormon sects would be false, okay? And so I just want to use an example for them. I said, well, now, I know people who believe that Joseph Smith is a prophet. They believe the Book of Mormon is the Word of God. They believe in the Doctrine and Covenants. But they do not believe that Thomas S. Monson is a true prophet. In fact, they believe Warren Jeffs, the leader of the fundamentalist group, is the true prophet that they should be following. And the reason why they believe that is because uh, they have been praying and asking God to know if he's the true prophet. And they got a, a revelation that told them that Warren Jeffs was it. Well, the question I have for them is, why did they get a different answer? Why didn't they get an answer that said that, Tom, no, Warren Jeffs isn't it. It's Thomas S. Monson over here. Okay. And the other question that's more complexing is, well, why, how do you know for sure that your answer that told you that Thomas S. Monson is a prophet is the right one? I mean, both of you are using the same methodology, but you're coming up with two different conclusions. Maybe you should be following Warren Jeffs. How do you know for sure? Okay, uh, and so um, and in the Warren Jeffs case, uh, you know, these people are giving up a lot. Um, they have to go underground. They're practicing polygamy. It's illegal. So, I mean, they have to be sure that this is what they got. And so they're not going to do it on a whim. They're going to do it after they know for sure that it's right. Uh, and so the last thing that I like to do is I like to logically 
just think about this, okay? So if God always feels good and the devil always feels bad, okay, uh, and that's how we identify them, um, then why would anyone who's trying to follow God ever be deceived by the devil? Okay, because I don't know anyone that wakes up in the morning, feels bad about something and says, oh yeah, that's the thing I need to do. I need to go follow Warren Jess because I feel bad about it. Okay, no, they don't do that. They feel good about it and then they go follow. Uh, and so um, those are three things that I like to talk about with a Mormon. And the reason why I'm doing this is because I want them to get out of their mentality that only feelings can show them the truth. Okay, and, and from then we can start talking about, well, what does the Bible have to say about this? Now, there's an example that uh, Jesus uses about those that are deceived. And he, he talks about them as being not knowing that they're being deceived. And so I need somebody to read uh, John 16, um, verses 2 through 3. John 16, verses 2 through 3. They shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. And these things they will do unto you, because they have not known the Father nor me. All right, so, uh, John, did they know that they were being deceived? No. No, they had no idea. They thought they were following God. Okay, they had no idea that uh, Jesus said that they were, thought they were doing them a service. And so the people that are deceived think that they're doing the right thing. They don't think that they're doing the wrong thing. They're surprised if you were to tell them uh, otherwise, okay? And so um, there, it is possible. So we need to find out what the Bible has to say about how we can know what comes from God and how we can know what comes from the devil. And so I, let's start by reading uh, 1 John um, verse 1 and 6. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Okay, so what is, what is John concerned about in this verse? Being astray. Being led astray. Okay, and so if... And he's, the reason why he's concerned is because there's these false spirits that people are, are having uh, uh, come and tell them different things. And he's trying to say, well, there's false prophets that gone on the world. You've got to test these things to make sure they're from God. And then he gives us this test. And the test is, um, you know, we're apostles. We've been sent by God. And those that listen to us, we know right away that they're following God. If they don't listen to us, then we know that they're not from God. Uh, and we can apply that even to the Old Testament prophets. If, if somebody's not listening to the Old Testament prophets, we can know right away that they're not following God, they're following their own thing. If, if they aren't, and so that can apply to any scripture uh, that we have. And so um, let's read uh, 2 Timothy 3, uh, 16 through 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished with all good works. All right, so what is Scripture good for according to that verse? I'm waiting for answers, guys, so you're going to have to give them to me. Okay, doctrine, reproof, uh, correction. Instruction. Instruction in righteousness. So there's a lot of things that Scripture is used for, for us to be able to know what the truth is. Okay? Um, and so the, I guess the foundational question that we need to ask at this point is, how do we know that the Scriptures that we have right now are from God? Okay? That they haven't been changed or mutilated over time. Okay? Um, now, as a Mormon coming out of Mormonism, that was one question that I needed to know the answer to. Is the Bible reliable? Has it been corrupted over time? Uh, and so 
I had to look at the evidence and see what was there. I was fascinated to find out that there was nearly 6,000 Greek New Testament manuscript copies that come from about 70 AD all the way to about 450 AD, and they come from different locations throughout Europe and, and the Old World um, and you know Jerusalem and, and Middle East. And when we bring these manuscripts together from different time periods and from different locations, they don't disagree with each other. They agree. That's tremendous evidence to show that we haven't lost the words of Paul and Peter and the apostles because as the Christians were going along, oh, this is a great letter from Paul, so they make a copy of it. And so they're making copies all over the place, and we can compare these. And they say the same thing. So uh, in order for uh, Mormonism to be right and say that um, these things have been corrupted, what we'd have to have is a massive conspiracy because all of them would have to be changed in order to happen, and it's just not possible. Um, or if it was, if, we, if that didn't happen, we would expect to see bodies of manuscripts that would be different than the other manuscripts, but that's not what happened. We, we can know f uh, for sure that the words of God have been preserved through time. The finding of the Dead Sea Scrolls, we got the whole Old Testament um, from that find. And we can compare that Hebrew with what we have today, and it says the same thing. That is tremendous evidence to show that the Bible hasn't been corrupted over time. He's literally established His Word so that we can know that it's there. So if we do have the words of Paul and Peter and the Apostles, then this verse in 2 Timothy applies. Scripture is good for doctrine, for reproof, for correction. So if we have something that they said that disagrees with what somebody else says, we're going with the Bible. We're not going to go with the other guy. Okay? And so that's how we can know. And even if we have a spirit, let's say we have an angel that appears to us um, and tells us something different than what the Bible says, then we can know right away that that angel did not come from God. Even if we felt good, even if that angel looked glorious, we can know right away that that wasn't from God. Okay? Um, and so... <clears throat> Let's read uh, 2 Peter 1.21. For the prophecy came not in old times by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. All right, so the scriptures came directly from God to man. Okay, this is not, uh, this is something that is established. Now, I want to read a couple scriptures talking about what Jesus and, had, and Isaiah had to say about the Word of God. Um, Jesus said, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Shall not pass away means never, guys. It's not going to happen. It could not happen. In order to say that the Bible is corrupt, you have to say that Jesus was a liar. Okay, uh, Isaiah said in Isaiah 40, verse 8, The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Forever. Okay, and so that is something that we can actually see in the manuscript evidence that God has made his word stand forever. All right, so... <clears throat> Uh, Paul, knowing that the scriptures were reliable, challenged us to do something. He even said to do this about himself. Okay, so I need somebody to read 1 Thessalonians 5.21. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. All right, so prove all things. Not just some things, all things. How do we do that? We go to the scriptures and we can say, look, the scriptures say this. But this says something different. That's the reproof that we're talking about in Timothy. Okay? Um, now, uh, Paul also, actually Luke wrote about this, but it was Paul and Silas that were doing the preaching. And you have to understand this. that Paul and Silas are having great success in preaching the gospel. They go to Thessalonica, and they preach the gospel, and the people are converted. Well, that sounds like a good thing, right? Okay? Well, he goes over to the next uh, area into Berea and he preaches the gospel there and this is what Luke had to say about the Bereans and rather than Thessalonians he said these were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so 
the Bereans were more noble than the Thessalonians because the Thessalonians just believed. They didn't look at the scriptures to see if Paul was right. But the Bereans said, well, I don't know. I'm going to take a look at what you have to say, and I'm going to go to the Word of God, and I'm going to see if it matches. Okay? And then after they did that, they said, ah, oh, he's right. We need to follow him. So those guys were more noble than the ones at Thessalonica because they did this. And that's how they knew what was true. They didn't. Now, what's, what's missing in the text here, if we're looking from a more perspective, they didn't get down on their knees and pray and ask God if it was right. They went to the scriptures and they said, ah, now we know it is right. Okay? So, um, and the reason why they didn't go and pray about it is because of what uh, it says in 2 Corinthians 11, um, verses 14 through 15. Um, somebody, did I sign that one out? I don't know if I did or not. Okay, I'm going to read that one. Um, and no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as ministers of righteousness. Okay, so if the, if the fallen angels can look like good angels, okay, um, and the ministers that are following the, the Satan and his gang can look like the good guys, okay, then we have to make sure by what they say it matches with the Word of God. Otherwise, we can be deceived, all right? Uh, and so um, Jesus was also concerned about this. In Matthew 24, uh, he had some uh, scriptures uh, or some things that he wanted to say about false prophets. So who has that? Jesus answered and said, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And many false prophets shall arise, and shall deceive many. For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets, and shall sow great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. All right, so I want to point some things out here. How many people would be deceived? Many. According to many, okay, not a few, many, all right, and how many false prophets would there be? Many, many false prophets, not just a few, many false prophets, and how many false Christs? Many false Christs, okay. Now, what are the characteristics of these false prophets and these false Christs? What are they? What are they able to do in here? They're show able to show signs and wonders, okay. So. Um, it isn't enough to have a miracle occur. I mean, uh, if we go back to Moses, okay, when he went before Pharaoh, he was commanded by God to throw down his stick and it turned into a snake. Well, Pharaoh's response was not to run out of the room, but he called his uh, magicians and his sorcerers in and they did the exact same thing. Okay, now these guys weren't working for God, and the only way that they knew that God was behind Moses is because uh, Moses' stick or his snake swallowed up the other two, okay? So we have to realize that there's a power on the other side. And this is really important. When we are witnessing to Mormons, we're not just, uh, this is not just a mental competition. We're not able to just uh, reason them out of Mormonism. This is a spiritual battle. It's between God and the devil, and they're, they're trapped in the chains uh, of deception, and God has to set them free. So we can't do it by our own power. We have to call upon God to be able to release them from that. Uh, and so don't go in um, thinking that you're just going to win the battle by what you have to say. You have to rely on God. You have to go there to be able to, to have them be set free. Um, now, the reason why uh, Mormons have so much problems and they have so much confusion is because they don't get this verse right. In 1 Corinthians 14, verses 32 through 33, And the spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace as in all the churches of the saints. Now, the spirits of the prophets means if I have a spiritual manifestation, it's subject to the prophets. And when they're talking prophets, we're talking Old Testament guys. They're talking about these guys in here, what they have to say. So if I have something that disagrees with what's in here, then guess what? It's out the door because it's my manifestation is subject to the prophets. Now in Mormonism, they have it backwards. It's the feelings that I have that supersedes this. 
And so therefore they have confusion and they don't understand what the truth is. And so if we could help them to understand that this comes first rather than their feelings, then they'll be on the right path. Um, and so we need to help them understand that feelings can uh, be deceitful to them. And the Bible is very clear on these things. Um, I'd like to uh, first read Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who could know it? Okay, so I want you guys to do a little exercise with me. Think of the most evil, lying politician that you can think of in your mind. You don't have to say his name, okay? You just think of whoever it is, all right? Now, I want to point this out. Your heart inside here is more deceitful than that guy is, whoever you thought of, okay? Because the heart is deceitful above all things. That includes evil politicians that lie. Okay, um, and so um, if we go to our hearts, we're going to be deceived. Um, let's read Proverbs twenty-eight twenty-six. He that trusteth in his own heart is a fool, but whoso walketh wisely, he shall be delivered. All right, so uh, this is what I love about Proverbs. They don't, it does not hold back, okay? Um, and essentially what it's saying there is if you trust in your heart, you're stupid. Okay, that's, that's the way that they used to say it in the King James. Um, and I want to finish up by reading Mark uh, 7, verses 20 through 23. And this is Jesus speaking, and this is what he says. He said, and, and he said, That which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, <coughs> proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. So if we look to our heart, our feelings will allow us to think that adultery is okay, that murder is okay, that lasciviousness is okay. That, uh, and so we can be led astray really easily by our hearts because our hearts doesn't is not on the heart the mind of God it's what we want uh, and so um, what it comes down to is this uh, if our feelings can lie to us and their spiritual manifestations can lie to us then we need to be absolutely certain that we are studied and know this word better than anything because it's very easy to be led astray and so the problem with Joseph Smith is that he believed that this Bible was corrupt the evidence is against that the evidence shows that the Bible has been preserved and these words in here are very different than the teachings of Joseph Smith and so if I'm left with a choice between what Joseph Smith taught or what the Bible taught, I need to go with this if I'm going to be following God. Uh, and so uh, I'd like to close us in prayer. Lord, we're grateful to be here to be able to discuss ways to be able to talk about feelings with our Mormon friends and neighbors. Lord, we uh, ask you to help us as we're discussing with them that they would realize the need to follow your word and, and begin to know that your word has been preserved, Lord. Lord, we know that this is a difficult transition for many Mormons because um, when they start looking at the truth, that it becomes very apparent that everything that they've ever been taught has been a lie. And so, Lord, we just ask you to be with those that are coming out of Mormonism that realize that Mormonism doesn't match with the Bible, that you would give them the strength to be able to stand up for you, even though it may be difficult. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.